Gosh, there's a lot to say, a lot going on in, in my heart, and I have a couple different ways that I could begin this message, but I think I'm just going to get right into um, chapter 1 in verse 11 in the book of Romans. And if you're looking for a title, um, I, I wrestled with a title of, of how to say it, but um, here's what I came up with. It's what stays when you leave. Okay, everybody say, what stays, what stays. when you leave? And you think about that for a second, you know, when, whenever you go camping or whenever you're hiking in the wilderness or whatever, I know you hike in the wilderness all the time, Phyllis, I've seen you out there hiking in the wilderness, <coughs> but when you do that, that kind of thing or you, you know, you go to the beach, <coughs> excuse me, you picnic, the idea is you want to leave things better than when you, how you found them, right? I mean, there's nothing worse than showing up in a beautiful place and seeing like cans and plastic bottles and all kinds of stuff and just trash laying there. And, and there, it's sort of like a, a memory of the person who was there. And the memory of that person who was there before you is not a good one, right? When you roll across that, you're just like, oh, thanks a lot, you know, and, and it brings a lot of just stuff out of you. And you don't even know that person, but you know all about them based on what they left right there in that beautiful place. Everybody tracking with me? And I think that sometimes in our spiritual lives, we have to think that way. You know, um, I think that in our spiritual lives and just in our day-to-day lives, we come into a situation and we leave a situation. And we're not sure, um, and maybe we're not thinking about it, but I think we need to think about how we're leaving a situation. And the Apostle Paul, he's writing into a, a, a cultural situation in the book of Romans. Scott did such a great job a few weeks ago talking about the message of unity that's in this letter to the Roman church. It's a very logical letter. In fact, if you are um, looking for something to read in your own times with the Lord, um, and, and you're a, a logic person, you know, this follows such a great argument. And an argument, I don't mean that in a negative way, I mean an academic argument. And, and what it follows is the need for, it basically tells the story that, that everybody is a mess, right? And, every, and we know that, you just flip on the news, you know, everybody is a mess, meaning that it, at the core of who they are, that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, and then it shows what Jesus has done for us. It shows the abundance of God's grace, you know. And I loved our worship today. I didn't touch bases with Joe on what I was going to teach about, but he just, you know, he, he did such a good job just setting me up for this message because the, the abundance of God's grace that we sang about, you know, and, and it's, it's here in this book of Romans. And then it leads you into this way of, of knowing him in terms of salvation. So once you, you know the bad news, it tells you what Jesus did, then it tells you the good news and how to get to the good news. Uh, how many of you remember the Romans road? Maybe at some point in, in your um, walk with God and discipleship that you were, you were learning how to lead someone to Christ. Does, anyone, does that term mean anything to anyone, the Romans road? Yeah, it's a, it's a pathway in the book of Romans that leads to salvation. And I thought just because, um, let's go through it, because it shows in God's word um, some of these things that I just described to you. And the first, the first uh, verse in the Romans road, I know I have you in, in chapter 1, verse 11, but that was just to throw you off. Um, <laughs> Verse 23 says this term that we're, we're, we're used to hearing um, when an evangelist speaks or when a pastor talks. He says, for all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, right? That every single person, it's the beginning of the road, the, the discovery and the realization that everybody is a sinner. That there's, um, as the Bible says, there's no one good, not even one, you know? And then you move on to, to Romans 3 in, in verse 9. It says, what shall we conclude? Are we any better? Are we... Um, not, all, not at all. We have already made the charge. Um, the Jews, the Gentiles are like under sin. In verse 10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. You know, and, and this is the time when the music is just getting really like low. I mean, in fact, we should probably dim the lights for my reading of this. So it's just like, oh, are you serious? It's just, just bad news, right? Don't dim the lights. I was kidding. Romans 5 in verse 6, it says, you see, and here's where the, the, on that road, you start to make the turn. You see, at just the right time, when we, will, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Everybody just should take a deep breath on that. Go, right? Because it isn't like once you cleaned yourself up and once that you know, neighbor that left a mess cleans up his mess and cleans up his mouth and all da, 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 that at that time, they're good candidates for salvation. But it says that while we were still powerless, while we couldn't do anything on our own, that, that, that Jesus came for us and God demonstrates this love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
And then the road continues on as you just plow through Romans a little bit and you come to verse 12. It says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death came to all men because, again, all have sinned. I know I'm going through this quick, but in 623, it says the, the cost of that sin, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Then we move on to Romans 10, and verse 9. He says, the word is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your hearts. And that is the word of faith we are proclaiming, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And then 13 says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so you see like the, the Apostle Paul is coming into this society in, this, in Rome, this situation that's fragmented, disjointed, um, lack of harmony, lack of love, um, all kinds of, of mess and madness. And he speaks encouragement, but the encouragement that he brings is he tells and he gives light to the situation. He tells the bad news and then he tells the good news. And I know that you know this good news and I know that you know the bad news, but I, I have a, just a sense in my heart that whether, um, whether you, you see it this way or not, I'm, I'm not sure. But as those that have the privilege and the responsibility to speak the gospel, we've got to make sure that the gospel we preach is the gospel. And so how do you find how to articulate this gospel? You know, how do you, how do you get the words to that gospel? You know, you come to God's word, and this is just one way to look at, at the gospel. And so um, maybe this is something of a side note for you. I do think it fits into the whole sermon, but if you wanted to just jot down some of those passages and begin to meditate, them on, meditate on them a little bit, um, it, it gets you started. But then we get into to Romans 1 in verse 11, and... Uh, and Paul says this interesting thing. And so I've been, again, like I said, I've been reading through this book because I just find, I'm finding a lot of comfort and a lot of strengthening in my own faith as I read through Romans. But I, I, I stopped at this one point because it, it just sort of struck me. It says, now I'm in chapter 1, verse 11. He says, I long to see you that I might impart some spiritual gift to you to make you strong so that you may be mutually encouraged by each other's, that, or excuse me, that we may be Mutually encouraged by each other's faith. When I read that, I, I stopped at a couple of words. The first word to impart. So he says, I long to see you. Like, I can't wait to see you. Because I want to impart some spiritual gift. And what does that word impart mean? You know, that, that, that's where I got the title. It's how you, you leave something. And when we talk about impartation, it's something different than if I'm handing you a, a piece of paper or a glass of water. But something of me, I'm leaving with you. Let me give you an example. Have you ever just been around somebody who is just, a, um, just an incredibly encouraging person, a person who's just filled with the love of God, the person who, um, who is strong in their faith, and when you're around them, the word of God frequently comes out of their mouth, and they may not be perfect, they may have issues and problems, but the way they handle their problems is just life-giving and encouraging to you. And when you're around them, do you find that you're like depressed and down and you're just like, man, I just want to give up and throw in the towel? When you're around them, don't you find yourself like sitting up a little taller? Don't you find yourself like going, okay, you know, uh, I'm going to be all right. Because something of them, a spiritual gift that's within them, something of them is passed on to you. And just being around them, even if they didn't say anything, even if they didn't have all kinds of good advice for you, just being around them imparts something from them to you. The opposite is also true. Okay, we just have to go there, right? Right? Do you know anybody who might just tend to be a little bit negative? I'm not talking about you because it's much easier in these situations to talk about other people, okay? So don't look at your own life right now. But you just know somebody who just tends to like, you know, the sky is blue and you're like, it's not really blue, it's like gray blue, you know? The sun's shining us, it's a little hazy really is what it is, you know, man, that water's so clear. Do you have any idea how much bacteria is in that water? I mean, it flows in all the rainwater from the drainage. Don't drink it. And when you're around that situation, when you're around somebody who, maybe they can't even help themselves, right? But when you're around, it's just like, 
you just walk away, your shoulders slump a little more, your, your head hangs a little more droopy, you slouch in your seat, and you're just kind of like, ugh. Because they don't even know that what they left you with was a bit of a mess. Just as oftentimes the person who has something to give you that's an impartation of a spiritual gift, they might not even know that what they left you with just made your day. And so how are you leaving people? And what is there, what's left when you leave the room or when you leave the situation or when you hang up the phone or when you finish that text or when you are playing Pokemon Go? I'm just kidding. (laughs) What's going on? We we were in the, the, the circle with my kids. We were riding bikes and some of the neighborhood kids and myself. And, and, and everywhere, on every corner, it was just like masses of people. Yeah, they're just on their phones. And, and then I was leaving the church on Wednesday night. And there were people in their car in the front parking lot. Like somebody put something here that makes you do something on that game to do, you know, whatever. So I think great tool for evangelism, you know, just knock on the window. Welcome. Here's a cup of cold water in Jesus' name. No, I, I don't know. But anyways, just a side note. Um, Paul says, in, I, I, I long to see you. There's a longing in my heart. He is fully aware of the mess that's happening in the church in Rome. He's fully aware of the chaos that's ensuing there. He's fully aware of, and, and there's racial issues going on. There's cultural issues going on. It's Christian fighting Christian based on their feeling of superiority and so forth. And if there's ever a message needed for our world today that relates with the message in Romans, it's the need for encouragement. And I want to tell you something. I think sometimes we have the wrong idea of what encouragement is. And and hear me out because it might take me a little bit to get there and I hope I don't offend anyone as I do. But encouragement is more than just saying, hey buddy, I hope you have a good day. Encouragement is more than, than a greeting card. Encouragement is more than well wishes. And all those things are good and right, and I would say, please, continue to do that. Be gracious to people. Be loving to people. But encouragement is something far deeper, because the Apostle Paul says, I long to impart to you some spiritual gift. Everybody say, some spiritual gift. Some spiritual gift. It's something from God. Do you understand what spiritual gifts are? They're spiritual, right? They come from God, and what, why we have them, and what's, in, what's given to us is the ability to, to express our faith. In, in a way that we can't do on our own. It's a gift. It gives us this ability to express our faith and, and build up somebody else's faith. Built into the word encouragement is this other word. What is that other word? Courage, right? Courage. That when you are an encourager, when you, when you impart, so in other words, when I give something that I have to somebody else, whether I do it intentionally or non-intentionally, that I'm leaving them with a measure of courage. And this world needs courage The body of Christ needs courage. Our community needs courage because there is a healthy, healthy dose of discouragement. So if encouragement means that I'm giving to you courage, and it's not just because I'm a great guy or because I, I read this really encouraging book or manual, it's because Christ is in me. And because somehow because Christ is in me, he's given me gifts. I'll show you in God's word. It's stuff that you already know, but, but, but he's put it in me. And I want to make sure that what's in me comes out to you. Because you need courage. But in the same way, when we, when we don't do that, when we decide that I'm not going to be an encourager in this situation, I, I've got no longing to speak into this moment or this person or whatever else, or I'm just bummed out and I want a pity party. Man, I just want to have a pity party. Like it feels good to feel bad. Let me feel bad. That what we do when we, when we interact with the body of Christ that we're linked to. Let me tell you something. You're linked to the person that's to the right and to the left of you. Even if you don't know them, you're linked to them. Part of your um, behavior, part of, of your faith, part of your expression directly impacts that person that's next to you. Like it or not. It just is the way that it is. If you read in Corinthians 12, you're going to understand that we're all connected together. And so when, when I choose not to be a part of that connection, when I choose to check out, then I literally open up the door for the enemy to just run ragged in my life. And then I'm not encouraging anymore. What am I doing? I'm discouraging. And I think we might have the wrong idea of what discouraging is too. Discouraging is no lightweight thing. It's no just like, oh man, I feel so bad. I think I totally bummed that guy out. It's not that. In terms of spirituality, in terms of your relationship with God, in terms of the body of Christ, discouragement is like pulling courage out of somebody. 
weakening them. I'm, pu- I'm, I'm just not into it right now, so I'm going to pull courage out of you. None of us would sign up to do that. If we had a life group on discouragement, it, it hopefully would be empty, right? We're not signing up going, oh, teach me how to be a better discourager. It's not in you. I know that. I know that. But it's these things that we're, if, if we like, aren't aware of them, they will happen. And, and we need courage like never before. The body of Christ needs courage like never before. And so he says, I long to see you so that I might impart to you some spiritual gift. Um, John Piper has this great quote, and he says this, that we are stewards of the currency of grace. We are stewards of the currency of grace. That means if grace was like money, right, a whole big stack of it, like me, I'm super rich. You should just see my bank. I'm just kidding. I don't know. I'm not. (laughs) So. I don't even know why I just said that. Sometimes I think things are funny, and then I say them, and I just say, why did I even say that? Anyways, grace, as has been given to us, and as you read the riches of God's grace in this, in this book of Romans, you, you understand it, but we are so filled with the grace of God. And, and it would be like if we did have a grace bank account, it would always be just filled, right? Always but out of that grace bank account, we're stewards of that. You know how you, we talk about like our, our deacons here, they're stewards of the finances of the church, or maybe there's a situation um, where you sit on a board for a nonprofit or whatever, you become a steward of that. So you, whatever you're given, you're charged with the responsibility to make sure that, the, that, that those resources fall in the right hands of the right people. So for us as the body of Christ, we're stewards of the currency of grace. And what a sad thing for any, any one of us to just protect that account of grace, right? To just keep it kind of to ourselves. When when the dynamic of of spending in the kingdom of God is what? The more that you give, the more that's there, right? And there's a good argument that says that that which you squander just goes away. And so when it comes to grace, when it comes to encouragement, when it comes to imparting some spiritual gift, give it freely, Give it freely to the point that it becomes just so natural to you that you don't even have to think about it when you're doing it. That it's just as an extension of who you are that you choose to be one who's handing out the currency of grace often. You know, when we, um, when we look at, at 1 Peter, you want to turn there, 1 Peter 4.10. This gives you a little bit of an insight as to what's inside of you. The Bible tells us that God gives these spiritual gifts to everybody, and he gives them by his grace, and he gives them as he sees fit. 1 Peter 4 and verse 10, Peter says that each each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in various forms. If anyone speaks... He should do it as one speaking the very words of God. Let's stop for a second there. This is heavy duty stuff. You know that you have been given like a tremendous authority as a, as a follower of Jesus. Because if this is all true, what I'm reading, that the actions and the things that what's inside of you when given to others can literally transform and change their lives. If this is all true, what I'm reading, that we should be doing this with full confidence because it's not something of us at all. It's not in me. I, trust me. I know myself outside of the grace of God. I know myself outside of the love of Jesus. It's not a pretty thing at all. I know some of you, beautiful people, every single one of you. But, but the reality is he should do so as speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do so with the strength that God provides, so that in all things, God might be praised through Christ Jesus. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. You know what it does for me, and I'm being a little silly this morning, but what it does for me is it takes that pressure to be amazing off of our shoulders. It takes that pressure to go, okay, I want to be a really good Christian. Like, I haven't found one yet, you know? Um, it, it's It's that pressure to perform, and it puts it into the position where you are submitted and surrendered to God and that what you have, you freely give, and it's God doing it, it's God in you, and it's God glorified. And I think that one of the greatest hindrances to us understanding our our power and the ability to encourage others in, in the Lord is probably comparison. 
It probably is sitting back and going, oh, man, I, I can't do it well. They do it so much better, so I'm not going to do it at all. And then I sort of wish that I had what they have. Does that relate with anybody? I, I think that what I read here is that God gives these gifts to whoever he wants to give them to. And certainly every single one of us have them. There's many lists of these spiritual gifts. And um, 1 Corinthians 12 has some things to say about it. But Romans also has a, a list of some gifts. And I want to read these things to you. And, and, um, and I want to let you know that I'm not, this message is not to say how you find out what this gift is or if you have this particular one or that particular one or how you use it. I'm just saying there's a lot of ways that we can impart Jesus to other people. And you find that as you learn who you are in Christ by doing encouragement, you find what you're good at and what you're not good at. Does that make sense? And so there's no fill-in-the-blank bubble chart um, test on how to find your gift this morning, but there is some, some lists of some types of things that we impart to others. And so why don't you turn with me to Romans 12 and verse 6. It says that we have different gifts according to the grace given us. If someone's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it's serving, let him serve. If it's teaching, let him teach. If it's encouraging, let him encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it's leadership, let him govern diligently. If it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. And interestingly, the very next thing, it says, love must be sincere. If you, if you look through um, 1 Corinthians 12, and you can kind of do this on your own, there's another list of some spiritual gifts. And then it, it's followed by what? 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, right? That's where it just talks about the love of God. And so these gifts, whether they be the, the list in, in Corinthians or the list in Romans, the word of God has made it clear for us that it's all done through love. And so my point is this, one of the most loving things that you can do is spend God's grace like crazy. And spending God's grace looks like imparting the Jesus in you to somebody else. There's an author that we like called Bob Goff. You know, I think it's him who said it, that, that we leak Jesus, right? That we're so filled with him that we, we begin to leak him. And, and that's kind of a cool concept if, it's, if it doesn't gross you out. It's kind of, it, it, it says something to me. Um, we get back to, to where we started in, in chapter 1, verse 11. It says, I long to see you so that I might impart to you some spiritual gift. There's something that I have that I want to deposit or, or leave you with. It's to make you strong, right? What I give makes you strong. And that is you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. You know, um, I'm sure that you struggle with discouragement at times. I know that I do. And I know that when, when I withdraw in that place of discouragement, I stay in discouragement. But when I activate spiritual gifts and begin to encourage others, guess what happens? Perspective changes. The light begins to break through and shine. And you, you, see, um, you see that encouragement come into you. And so Paul's saying that. He's saying, look, it's good for me and it's good for you that I do this, that I impart. Um, do you know that, that statement that we make oftentimes around giving? It says, give and it shall be given to you, pressed down, right? It's, it's, this comes out of Luke 38. Give and it will be given to you in good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. It will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Does anybody know what the context of that is? Jesus is talking about all his, his, his the core of his teachings, the stuff that requires only the Spirit of God to enable you to do it. He talks about in that, leading up to that, um, don't just bless the people who like you, bless the people who curse you. Don't just love those who love you, love your enemies, right? And then he gets into the big stuff. And the last thing that he says before he makes this statement is forgive, forgive. And out of this place of forgiveness, out of extending grace, right? Out of extending grace, give Give grace, give it, just give it liberally, just give it, and it will be given to you, pressed down, right? The, the amount that you desire. And so, so if you are good stewards of the currency of grace, you will find that you will also be a person who is deeply encouraged and who is able to impart courage. 
Um, I don't know if you were here on Wednesday night, but I just really enjoyed it. My wife taught. She did a fantastic job. It was, it was a, a great teaching. Um, ben and Charm shared their story about a really difficult time in their life, a uh, time when, when they lost their child at 38 weeks. And they were so open and, and vulnerable with us. And, and one of the things that, really, that I took away from their testimony was that in a moment of weakness for them, that who they relied upon for strength was obviously God, but the way that God showed himself to them was through people, right? And the way that God's grace was imparted and poured into them was through the love of others. And where they got their courage was in that encouragement. And with the encouragement that they received, that they have now, through the years, been able to encourage others. It's a beautiful redemption story of a very difficult thing. But one of the things that Ben said that, that'll stick with me is he encouraged us to show up, right? And sometimes we lack the ability to encourage because we don't want to say the wrong thing. Anybody ever been there before? You know, when, it, when a situation is awkward, when, when you either maybe you're frustrated at someone or you don't know how to be an encouragement. That's why impartation is so important because you being there means something because what's in you leaks out to other people. Does this make sense? It's not that, it's not, it's not difficult to really understand. It's so simple that it's so beautiful, but the application of it is so important. And so what they shared with us was with the, the lack of, you know, with being fearful about saying the wrong thing, sometimes we don't, we just don't show up at all. But being there, a ministry of presence really um, transforms and really gives courage where it's needed. So show up. Um, I started to think about some things practically, and, and hopefully this can be some, um, I don't know, some, maybe some application for you as you think in, through your week about how I might be able to do this better, how I might be able to consider the way I'm leaving a situation, um, to be more aware of when I walk out of the room, what's going to be said, you know? Oh, man, I sure hope that I, when I walk out of the room, it's not like, that was weird, you know? I hope that when I walk out of the room, it's not like, glad that guy's gone. But, but, but I hope that when I walk out of the room, it's like, okay, I feel a little better. I think we can do this, you know? And, and I think that we're all on the same page. I got to tell you a funny story. Um, so this week, my son had a birthday, and my daughter said that for his present, he was gonna, she was going to buy him a lizard, you know? And so we went through and said, yeah, I think that's a great idea because we're into um, animals. We like them. We have chickens and a dog and now a lizard. And um, we have some very cool chickens, by the way. They just are very cool. If you ever want to stop by, um, very interesting creatures, these chickens. But so they're, they're looking into this lizard, and I'm thinking, great idea, because the lizard's like seven bucks. It's awesome. And we already had the lizard cage, and I thought it was a great gift for his sister to give him. And, you know, pets teach kids responsibility and whatever else. So then so Daniel starts researching these lizards and finds that there's an even better lizard than the lizard that she was going to get for seven bucks, Right. And this lizard's a little more expensive, so they're negotiating, you know, um, Kate's investment into that, and, and because it was going to be more money. And if you know my son, yeah, he rolls deep. This kid always has money. I don't know where he gets it. He he is so generous, and and he works hard and does odd jobs for neighbors, and so he's just always got a roll in his pocket. He's just like, I got that, you know, beautiful. And so a combination of his birthday money and and whatever else he had in his pocket. Um, he said, no, no, we can do this. Let's, let's get this other lizard. And this, this is the kind of lizard that you can like, talk to and stuff, and it hangs out on your chest. It's like a dog lizard of some sort. I have no idea. <laughs> so we go to the store to, to look at the lizards, and then um, you, know, you just can't buy the lizard because then you have to buy the lizard stuff, right? The, the food that it eats, and then the guy is just, like, just knows so much, and he's you know, the calcium that it has to lick so that it doesn't get a tummy ache, and then you know, then the lamp that you have to keep it all just right. And then the humidity has to, you know, so these gauges that have to go in there. And so I'm just kind of doing the math, right, as it's going along. Okay. And so I just said, he, he, my, and my son is just like amped. He's just talking to the guy and he knows some stuff because he's been reading. The two of them are like two bees in a pod. Just like, yeah, okay, yeah, we could do this. And, and then I, I, the deep encourager, come into the situation and I go, all right, you cool with this? And I go, because your $7 lizards turn into like 85 bucks really fast. <laughs> and he just looked at me, and like all the joy just came out of his face. Like his, she's like, Aw. and he's like, okay. And, and I'm like, I'm just saying, I know you have plenty of money. I just want to make sure that you're not surprised when you get up to the counter, because I've been kind of keeping a track here. And he's like, 
Yeah, okay. So then, like, happy, joy, joy, courage goes to discouragement, right? Now he's second-guessing everything. Maybe I don't need that, you know, just like, and, and I stopped him, and I said, did I bum you out? He goes, Dad, you kind of killed it with the $85 comment. <laughs> so I said, now you know my son has an $85 lizard. Like, don't judge us, okay? But <clears throat> so, so I, I just said, buddy, you know what? It's cool. I think you should do it. You know, and it ends up being the best pet ever for sure. But the point is this, that in, in one little statement, whether I was wise to do that or unwise to do it, I could probably use that story in two different ways. Who knows? But in that situation, I really did see how it just took all the courage out of them and how it just took the joy away. And I think sometimes we can do the same things with one another. So when we look at, at how we begin to apply this stuff, how we encourage, um, one, that, that dynamic between you giving away grace and you giving away courage to others and how it affects your life. There might be some of you that are here this morning and, and maybe you wear a great smile and, and on the outside you're, you appear as though everything's great. And if someone was to talk to you and you told them you let them into your discouragement, they would be shocked. They would just go, I can't believe that you're discouraged. You're such a happy person. Um, and so I'm, I'm speaking to you this morning and maybe that's you. And maybe there's something that, um, that is really just dragging you down and you want to be a better encourager. The first thing that I want to say is um, we see this dynamic in the Bible and you read about it in 1 Samuel 30 in verse 6. And David in the Bible was a leader and I'm sure that as a leader there was this need to present himself in such a way that others couldn't tell that he was so deeply discouraged, but he was. And it says in there that David did what? He encouraged himself in the Lord. And so as you seek to understand, how can I be an encouragement? How can I give away grace abundantly when I don't feel like giving away grace abundantly, when I don't feel um, courage and happy? I want to I encourage you to encourage yourself in the Lord. And that's that first step of doing what you already know to do. Maybe it's getting back to a routine with your, your reading and your praying um, like you used to do, or maybe it's discovering a new one that works for you and just beginning to meditate on God's word, or finding those particular passages that, that will bring you back to a place of, of, of true north and really understanding the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Um, the second thing that I, I think on a practical level, if you're, if you're first encouraging yourself, maybe you find yourself in a situation where uh, you are around a lot of discouraging people. It might be time for you to make some new friends. And I mean that, I mean that in, a, in a serious way. I, I mean that if the, if the bulk of your input is discouraging input, you might need to learn ways to remove yourself from those situations and find yourself friends who focus on the same things you focus on, those who, who love Jesus, those who encourage themselves in the Lord, those who are able to see what God is up to, even in dark and difficult times. Now, I know there are some of you that are like, yes, the pastor said now that I can bail from this or that. Listen, <laughs> There are some of you that don't get the privilege of leaving a discouraging relationship. Some of you are connected by a covenant. Work it out. You know what I mean? Work it out. Look within your marriage relationship. And if you find that you're the source of discouragement, repent. Repent. Ask the Lord to forgive you. Ask the Lord to strengthen you. If, you. if you find that it's easy for you to only see the fault in your, in your spouse, repent, right? Because see what, what that, that covenant is supposed to be for everybody? To see it's supposed to be the signpost for God's love, right? Everybody's supposed to look and go, wow, those two are married. They're Christians. That's what God's love looked like. Amazing. I want what they have. And if that's not at work, you've got to go back to those basics there. As the, as the husband, am I loving her as Christ loved the church? Am I laying down my life for her? You know, am I, as a wife, am I showing that respect and that honor? Are we, are we competing in the, in the correct way? The only great competition there is outdoing each other and showing honor, right? And so that's some stuff to, to look at. Um, it's not easy, but it's the right thing to do. And so... Understand this, that you, if you can't get out of a situation where there's discouragement, do your best to be the thermostat, not the thermometer, okay? If you're in a situation that you can't get out of that's discouraging, you might not be able to quit your job just because you don't like your boss because he's discouraging. That might not be the right decision for you. Be the thermostat, not the thermometer. 
right? The thermostat is the one who, who, who sets the tone of the room, the atmosphere of the room. The thermometer just tells the temperature, right? Man, it's hot in here. Easy job, thermometer, easy job. Thermostat, difficult job. But that's what God's called us to. And as we impart not just our personality, not just our hopes and our wishes, but as we impart what is inside of us, the goodness of Jesus Christ, spiritual gifting, as that leaks out, it changes the atmosphere. This is my last and, and, and final point. And then, in fact, I'll invite Joe, if you want to come back up with your team to, to lead us as we wrap up our service. You're called to be a hope bringer, right, as the body of Christ, to bring hope into situations, to impart courage. You're, you're called um, to, to bring that hope, as I said, but you're also called to be an agent of change. And as I was reading through and thinking these things throughout the week, I came to this other passage in Romans 5.17. And so this is for me, I want to leave this with you as, um, as an example or as, as some fuel to really meditate on who our God is. Paul so beautifully talks about, and he's presenting this case to them so he can say, hey, remember your father Abraham. He's talking to Jewish believers and he's saying, what do you love about him? You know, you're so proud of him. What do you love about him? This is how your father Abraham saw your God. And so in your situation, whether you're deeply encouraged or whether you're discouraged, may you just take this to heart. It says, he is the God who gives life to dead things and calls those things that are not as though they were, okay? Maybe I can just ask you to close your eyes and just as best as you can, don't fall asleep. This is a critical moment. (laughs) No, but in all honesty, close your eyes and, and, and hear these words. He's the God who gives life to dead things and calls things that are not as though they were. And what that means to me is that maybe there are some dead dreams in your heart. Maybe there are some dead hopes, some dead goals. Maybe there are some dead relationships. I don't know. But what I just read about was a God who gives life to dead things. That is impossible in human terms, but through spiritual things, through spiritual gifts, God is able. The second thing that I read is that he's able to see things that you don't yet see. He's able to call things out that don't even exist yet. He is so creative in that way. And if I know his character and if I know his nature, then I know that the future in him is trustworthy and true and right and good. And so when I hear the statement growing up here, I remember Pastor Noel used to say it so often, it resounds and whenever I hear it, it puts a smile on my face because it reminds me of those messages, but it also just reminds me of the truth that my best days are ahead of me. And your best days are ahead of you. That's not just positive reinforcement, but that's good theology. Your best days are ahead of you because the God that you serve sees things that don't even exist yet and he calls them out. Be encouraged. Be deeply encouraged. Not just so that you can enjoy a moment of encouragement, but so that you might encourage others. So that you, the light of the world, a city that's set on a hill, in a time where a society needs it more than ever, might impart courage and not withdraw courage and discourage people. So let's just stand and rise to our feet this morning. And God, as we look at your word, as we examine it, as we seek you, may we find you. Lord, as we understand who we are, those who've been gifted with spiritual gifts, who've been given the authority to use them as if it were you saying the words, as if it were you doing the act. May we use what's inside of us to bring courage to other people, to strengthen them. Father, we pray for the body of Christ all throughout our nation. God, we pray for places like Texas, places like Baton Rouge. Lord, we pray for our own community and our own city. God, we pray for our nation as a whole. May we be the light of the world, just as you, our Savior, are that light, that that Romans road that we talked about is the truth that it leads to salvation, that where a people are are so uh, being divided, may we be unifiers, and the thing that brings us together would be Jesus Christ, that we would be good stewards of the currency of grace and that we would spend it like crazy, As we spend that grace, God, may we not only encourage others, but may may we be encouraged. Bless your people today. I'm just going to ask Joe to sing a song. And and as he sings this song, um, let the word of God just wash over you. 
And let whatever is not of God's word wash out of you. I know that, that God is faithful. And so I pray that what is left with you is what he intends. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, the presence, Lord. I taste it. The sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. I'm undone in your presence, Lord. We welcome you here, Lord. Holy Spirit. we thank you for your presence. Lord, we thank you that you're alive in our hearts. We thank you that you're good and your mercies endure forever. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who is slow to anger and you're rich in love. But we thank you that you're a God who's just. We thank you that you're a God who left a way, God, a way that we might know you, a way to salvation, a way to hope, a way to freedom. And we're grateful for that, God. Would you encourage us today? Would you encourage your people that we too might be encouragers to others? Bless your people today, I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, I want to dismiss you, but if you need prayer for anything, our altars are open. We'd love to pray for you. God bless you and have a wonderful week.